So in this week's video, I'm gonna teach you guys how to freeze motion in the studio. But first, I've gotta make Fernando jump for like the 1,000th time. One, two, three, jump. Well, as you saw in the beginning of this video, I've been conducting tests this week on how to best freeze motion. I could just skip ahead to the results and tell you what to do, but if I did that, I would gloss over two very important concepts that I think you guys need to know in order to freeze motion, and those are flash duration and overpowering the ambient light. Flash tubes emit pulses of light each time you take a photo, often with the burst being more intense in the beginning and then it trails off over time. The length of time that light is emitting from the flash is known as the flash duration. You can imagine this if you recall the effect of being blasted in the face with an on-camera strobe while posing for a photo. Flash duration can be expressed in two ways, T.5 and T.1. T.5 is when the pulse drops to 50% of its maximum, and T.1 is when it drops to only 10% of its maximum intensity. You can see this relationship on this graph created by Sekonic. To me, T.1 numbers are far more useful than T.5 numbers because they more fully represent the information. But unfortunately, there isn't a formula to convert T.5 specs to T.1. If you're interested in finding the flash duration specs for your flash, please consult your manual. The fastest your camera can send a signal to a flash normally and have it fire while the shutter is open is known as the sync speed. In the studio, your camera's sync speed isn't much of an issue unless you have a lot of ambient light in the room. Typically, if you're adding so much flash to the scene that your exposure without that flash at the same settings would result in a black image, the only thing freezing motion in your frame is the flash duration. So effectively, the flash duration becomes the shutter speed. And a T.1 number is basically equal to the same shutter speed, whereas you really can't equate a T.5 number to anything. However, if you're using flash at a 200th of a second, a common sync speed with moving subjects outdoors during the day or in a bright room, you can get blurry images regardless of your flash duration because the ambient light will have an effect on your exposure. So you will want to either overpower the ambient light with flash or you will want to use a shutter speed that can freeze motion on its own. But the only way to do that is high speed sync and unfortunately that is a whole other video. So everything that I'm gonna be talking about today will be based on traditional flash at or below your camera's sync speed. I first learned of flash duration in the late 90s when I was just a spry 18 year old photographer and I wanted to light an NBA arena. The older photographers I knew said that I needed a flash duration of a 2,000th of a second or faster and that I needed to overpower the ambient light by at least two stops in order to freeze basketball. I never ended up lighting an NBA game, but I did use this knowledge for college basketball, pretend basketball, and minor league hockey. Now back then, I just assumed that what they said was 100% true, but over the years, I've started to question whether or not their advice was really 100% accurate. So in a few moments, we're going to investigate how fast your flash duration needs to be to freeze a dancer jumping through the air and how much you need to overpower the ambient while photographing a model with long hair blowing in the artificial wind. Now, knowing your flash duration and understanding what it means can also be important for applications other than extreme movement because I have seen motion blur in my frames when just photographing models posing in the studio when I had a flash duration of around T.5, one one thousandth of a second. Reducing the power output of your lights usually results in faster flash duration, but some models like the Pro Photo D1 have their fastest flash duration 
at full power. So consult your manual to learn what power settings will result in the fastest flash duration and slowest flash duration for your light. But for most units, the fastest duration for your light will be at minimum power. So the brighter you make your flash, the slower the duration will become. The newest Elenchrome models display the flash duration on the LCD as you adjust the power of the light. And you can see the duration does follow that general principle, but sometimes it does jump around on some models. However, changing the power of your flash to get better flash duration may have consequences with inexpensive brands. Cheaper strobes may have slow flash duration in general, and they may emit light that is inconsistent in both color temperature and brightness from flash to flash or at different power settings. Essentially, if you uh, turn it down, it may become warm or cold, and if you turn it up, it may do just the opposite on every flash. I have been using uh, Ellen Chrome and Profoto lights for the last 10 or so years, and the brightness and color temperature is very consistent flash to flash with almost all of their lights at almost all of the settings. The only way to know for sure how your lights will perform is to test them out, but I'm very happy with my current Ellen Chrome lights. So let's see how this plays out in the real world. For this first test, I'm going to investigate how fast our flash duration must be to freeze professional dancer, model, and newly minted photographer Fernando while he's jumping through the air. When you're evaluating flash duration, you want to pay close attention to the movement that is taking place furthest away from the body because the hands and feet move a lot faster than the subject's torso. While we're going to investigate how much we need to overpower our ambient in the next demo, I want to give you the ambient light for this scene for context. My set was lit with the modeling light and a Nanlite FS300 in a 90 centimeter parabolic softbox, and the exposure was one full second at f7.1 at ISO 100. The light that I'm using is an Ellen Chrome ELC 500, which has a T.1 flash duration of 19,430th of a second at minimum power, and a T.1 of 1,250th of a second at max power. The flash duration is displayed in real time on the rear LCD. After some trial and error, we decided on set that Fernando would repeat this jump, which was, well, repeatable, and had a fair amount of movement. The first results I want to show you are from this series, which was shot at full power, which translates to a flash duration of 1 to 50th of a second, T.1. My exposure was 1 to 100th of a second at F7.1 ISO 50, which was 8.3 stops over the ambient light. As you can see, his feet are quite blurry, and in case you didn't notice, the flash didn't fire on the first frame in this sequence. And if you look at it here, you'll notice that it's completely blank, proving that there is no ambient light contributing to the blur in these images. After turning the light down to half power, the flash duration increased to T.1, 1968th of a second. My exposure was 1 200th of a second at f7.1 ISO 100, which was 7.3 stops over the ambient light. But unfortunately, as we zoom in here, you can see that his feet are still blurry. Next, I turned my light down to one quarter power, which gave me a flash duration of T.1 1 over 1869. My exposure was 1 200th of a second at f7.1 at ISO 200, which was 6.3 stops over the ambient. If we zoom in here to his front foot, you'll see that things are looking a lot more frozen, but as we move over here to his rear foot, you can see that there's some movement as well as a small sticker. Finally, I turned the light down to 1 8th power, which gave me a flash duration of T.1, 
1 over 3,184. My exposure was 1 200th of a second at f7.1, ISO 400, which was 5.3 stops over the ambient. As you can see, everything is perfectly frozen. And just for a frame of reference, the flash didn't fire on this frame, which was shot at the same equivalent exposure as the last series, and it's blank except for the chrome on the light stand. But before we move on, I wanted to let you know about my exclusive members-only learning platform, The Academy with John Gress. On The Academy, you'll find exclusive tutorials that are longer than the ones that you can find here on YouTube. You'll get access to twice monthly live Q&A and critique sessions. You'll also get early access to my YouTube videos and discounts on in-person workshops. So for more information and to sign up for a three-day free trial, please visit johngress.com academy for more information. So remember how the older photographers told me that I needed to overpower the ambient light by at least two stops? Let's go ahead and investigate that and see if it's true. For this test, I blew Junior's lovely locks to the side with a fan. My set was lit with natural light with light coming in from the windows and two Nanlite FS300s with reflectors pointed at the ceiling. This frame was shot with available light at 1 100th of a second F3.2 at ISO 400. As you can see, there is quite a bit of motion blur in his hair which you would expect shooting at 1 100th of a second. I didn't shoot at 1 200th of a second, my sync speed, because I wanted to make sure that the motion blur was obvious. I lit this series with my Ellen Chrome 1 in action mode inside of my Parabolix 35D. For the first series of shots, I had my strobe at minimum power, which is 0.1 on the Ellen Chrome scale, and I got a flash duration of 1 7,751st of a second. My exposure was 1 100th of a second F3.2 at ISO 200, which was one stop over the ambient light. When shooting at F3.2 on this 85 millimeter lens, you would expect there to be limited depth of field, which will make things that are further away from his face, front to back, look blurry. So let's look at the hair that is in the same plane as his eyes. And as you can see, there is some motion blur going on here and ghosting caused by the brief burst of flash blending together with the ambient light. After doubling my power to 0.2 on the Ellen Chrome scale, the flash duration lengthened to 1 7,462nd of a second. But I was able to shoot at 1 100th of a second F4.5 ISO 200 or two stops over the ambient light. At this flash duration, you would expect everything to be frozen, but the ambient light is still bleeding in and things are still blurry. Next, I turned my light up another stop to 1.2 and I got a flash duration of 1 over 5,235. Then I shot this frame at 1 100th of a second F6.3 ISO 200 or three stops over the ambient light. And instantly as we zoom in here, you can see that everything is completely frozen. And just to confirm our final burst, Let's turn the light up another stop to 2.2. The resulting flash duration was 1 3,355. I then exposed my frame four stops over the ambient. And once again, everything is completely frozen. After figuring out the perfect exposure and flash duration for freezing motion, I added some more lights, gels, and went to work. So, were those old curmudgeons right? Did I really need to overpower ambient by two stops and have the flash duration as fast as one two thousandth of a second to shoot basketball? Well, not exactly. Back then we were shooting film with old lenses and scanning grainy negatives to create about three to six megapixel files. 
So those images may have looked fine back then, but those numbers don't hold up today. Given how much detail you can resolve with current lenses and how much you can zoom in, you want to overpower the ambient light by at least three stops and get your duration numbers around one three thousandth of a second or shorter. And as always, zoom in on set and make sure you're getting the results that you need. Thank you so much for watching. Stay safe, have a great day, and I'll talk to you soon. You just made the case for the Elantron 1. <laughs> Cable free. <laughs>